right, good morning. It's great to see you all. I'm so excited about the passage today we're going to look at. We're in the book of Galatians. Well, you can see that, couldn't you? Um, my little, little, little walk-up music. Um, but uh, we've had an incredible summer walking through the book of Galatians, finding freedom in Christ is what we've talked about. You know, with every new day of school, our new year, uh, I know Stacey and I, we take the pick, right? You get the first day of school pick and and uh, then through the years, you watch and see, and you see your kids grow up, and um, you hope that with that freedom, like that's what growing up is, right, is giving kids a little more freedom, a little more freedom. You hope that maturity matches the freedom. That's the tension, right? That along with growing older, they're actually getting more mature and able to handle freedom. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to talk a lot about that today. And what does that look like in our spiritual lives? Because some of our parents, I know this week's going to be, uh, you know, I talked to some college students, uh, freshmen. We, I, was, I was with our, our um, sports outreach uh, crew who did a great job this, this summer with camps and all. And I was with them this week and they're going off back to college or back to seminary and all the things. And some of you parents, I mean, you're going to be, you know, this week, mixed emotions, right? Um, we're going to be, some of y'all be in tears, you know, sending your kids off. To preschool, and you know it's traumatic. I mean, it's it's a hard thing, and and it, then but it's that first moment of releasing them into a life that is apart from you, right? I mean, that's part of the deal. If they don't leave, you didn't you didn't do the thing. I mean, you didn't do it, and and so today we're going to talk about uh, freedom and how this plays out. So if you have uh, have your Bible, I want you to turn to. Um, to Galatians 4. Here's what we've said. Here's the definition we've offered. Um, Freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. This is what the world will tell us. Uh, Freedom is doing what you ought to do. And this is what every parent in here is is about. Like, yes, that's what I want for my kids. But because we all know a million stories of untethered freedom gone bad, right? Like a kid gets his license. Freedom, you know, and don't handle it well. A kid goes off to college. No parents and doesn't handle it well. Uh, even, even in business, somebody get, is given new resource, given too much power, too much influence, go south. We don't handle freedom very well. And today we're going to talk about this interplay between uh, immaturity, which Paul, we're going to see here in Galatians, calls bondage, slavery, maturity, which is freedom. And then we're going to talk about how to live in that freedom. There's a twist at the end. And we're actually going to end our time. Okay, spoiler alert. Um, we're going to end our time in, in prayer together. A prayer, a time of commitment. I'm going to ask you, today's the day. Cross a line. Say yes to the Lord. And a good day to do that. And we're going to have a time of prayer. Prayer time. Where I'm going to uh, just guide us there. You're going to have an opportunity to pray in this, this new season you're entering into. So um, one of the things I also want you to grab, a little, little shout out. Uh, if you haven't seen this, you need to pick this up. This is Grow, and it's on our website. It's the first page you see when, when you, when you uh, go to our website there. If you're watching us online, you go there. But uh, grab this, because in this are a million, I think there's a million, opportunities for you to get involved. Amazing things that are happening. And you're, you're going to want to know all that's happening. Midweek stuff, I mean, throughout the week stuff is what it is, uh, including our Wednesday night, um, all that's kicking off on September uh, 7th. So it's all coming up. Grab one of those. It's an opportunity for you to get plugged in. All right? It's time. It's time is what we're getting to. So in Galatians 3, to set this in context, we're going to get to 4. Paul has been saying, really throughout the book, on repeat, he is, he's on this rant, on repeat, you're justified, that's the word, everybody say justified, justified, okay, we, that sounds like a theological word, we don't use a whole lot, but we're all seeking to justify ourselves, all seeking to validate our existence in some form or another, through some identity, through some job, through something, through the stuff I have, the approval of others, performance in some realm of life to verify, validate, justify yourself. We're all, we all do this in varying degrees. And we run in all kinds of places to do this. But he has been saying the most radical message. Here's this religious you know, Pharisee, formerly, who uh, is speaking primarily to a Jewish audience we're, we're, who've been living under the law, is, is the word, capital L, law, the, all the commands of God. And he's been like uber religious. Like nobody has done it like Paul, if you know his story. 
And, and then he says this. He says, here's the new message. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the gospel. And this is what he's been talking about. You're justified. Uh, if you come to Christ, we'll talk about what, what does that mean? When you give your life to him, when you have faith, that's his, his challenge. Faith, not works. You're justified by faith in what Christ has done, not what you've done or anything you can do. And he says, this is the good news that's come to us. Changed his life as it's changed my life and so many of us. And he is so passionate about this. He says, we got to graduate from the old way. Now it's the way of faith. Next level. So we're talking about moving up elementary school to middle school to high school, whatever. This, this, this is an apt analogy that he's going to show us here uh, to get away from the elementary things of the world. And we're going to explain that here in a moment. And let's move to faith in Christ. That's where freedom is found. So first, here's how this plays out. Immaturity is slavery. Here's what he says. In chapter 4, verse 1, again, he's already said that if, if you're immature, you're being held captive Imprisoned is the word that he uses in, in uh, Galatians 3. And, and he would note, before we get there, the, the problem with unrestrained freedom is that the world doesn't take into account this thing that the Bible calls sin, right? Given over to whatever I want to do, I will self-destruct because sin by its nature is self-destructive. Paul says you're in bondage if, you're, if, you're not, if you've not been rescued from your sin. And so he's continuing this argument, okay? He's been saying the faith has come through, through, through now we're heirs to the promise that God's been about all along through Abraham. He's, there's this Jewish guy telling us now this, this membership to God's family is open up to everybody, which was the original promise that was given to Abraham, and it's come through Christ. Look at this. He presses on. Don't let the distinctions of chapters fool you here. He's still this train of thought. I mean that the heir, verse 1, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Now, in Roman law, we get this. A child was not given, right, not an heir uh, until they'd reached puberty, essentially. They, they had to reach a certain age. We understand this. You can't drive till you're old enough. You can't get a job. You can't vote. You can't drink. You can't do a lot of things till you're at a certain point. This is the analogy he's making. So track with me. And, and he's going to talk about how this plays out spiritually. You're not free to receive what's yours until you reach a point. And his point is going to be this level of faith, not work. So the twist, of course, is that the heir actually does own everything but not yet. So he's playing this out. Before you come to Christ, this is where you are. But he is, a, he is under guardians and managers. He's already been talking about this. The pedagogos is the word, the pedago, who, who is a child conductor, this tutor that comes along the child, manager. He says the law has been like that, just guiding us along until the date set by the father. In verse three, in the same way also, we also, when we were children, okay, before we came, came to Christ, came to faith, we're enslaved in the elementary principles of this world. Now, I'm going to spend some time on this, first, on this first point. Really spend a lot of time on this. And this phrase in particular, this is rudimentary education, I think. Uh, another translation, rudimentary principles of this world. This is base level, okay, elementary. Uh, this is primal understanding of life. It's kind of like saying th this, these are the ABCs of the universe. Meaning it's essentially cause and effect. You do this, this happens. Uh, you work hard, you get paid. Uh, in, in religion, we, we step over into religion then. It's, it's um, you, uh, you do this thing and God does this thing. You obey him and then he blesses you. And a lot of people, a lot of Christians live this way. Where we think that if I do this, I will gain acceptance from God. The gospel says you're accepted. Now obey him. You're already accepted. And so he says the rudimentary principles of this world are really just kind of cause and effect. It's a law of reciprocity. He says, we're moving past that. This is now next level. He says the promise that's come to us through Abraham, through Christ ultimately, is a promise, if you were here a couple weeks ago, not a contract. Contract demands two people doing their part. He says, no, 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 we're not doing our part. We'll never do our part. This is one-way love. 
This is grace that's come to us. And this is the great exchange. Christ's righteousness for our sin. And he's used, he's used this accounting term earlier on to say, your ledger, bankrupt, condemned, empty, nothing. For Christ's ledger, perfect, righteous. And he exchanges the two and he says, now you've been justified. That's it. But now he's challenging us because here's what happens. Even Christians, even we come to Christ, I think I understand I'm justified in Christ. We've got to constantly go back to that or we forget. And we enter back into slavery. This is what he's going to show us here. But who in the world would want to live in prison? Those who find themselves back in prison are those who haven't grasped justification because you're not going back to it constantly and you've not committed yourself to ongoing sanctification. These are the two big words that you're hearing here on repeat and it's, all, it's what this is all about. Going back to the fact that we've been justified by grace. And if you're new here, I've met a lot of new folks today. If you're new here, you need to understand this. This is not a new message here, right? All my members say amen. All right, amen. We're all about the grace of God. It's all we've got. But we are committed to, yes, justification. We're committed to sanctification. And my challenge for you today is, have you really committed your entire life to being a disciple an apprentice of Jesus to become just like him. We'll get there. This is where Paul is going. But who would want to stay in prison? Some of you have seen um, maybe the greatest movie of all time. I hope you have. Shawshank Redemption. Uh, and in it, there's a sub-story of a guy named Brooks who finally gets out of prison after many years. And, um, spoiler alert, but Brooks ends up finally... He's free. He gets a little apartment, gets him a little job, and he can't live in freedom. As so many. He knows how to live in prison. He can't live in the big free space of the, of the world. And he ends up uh, committing, he hangs himself. Writes on the wall, Brooks was here. That's it. Because, watch this, he understood how to live out his identity as a prisoner. He didn't know any other way to live. And some of us, if we're not careful, we fall, we, here's what we do. We adopt a new moralism. I'm a Christian now, and now I'll do the things and appease God or gain acceptance or feel good about myself. And we, we go back to kind of a new kind of law. And even like Brooks, I'll wake up when you tell me to wake up. I'll put on what you, you tell me to wear. I'll eat when you tell me to eat. I'll, and he, he's, he's living this life, and he, and he actually has relationships in prison. That was part of the, part of the story. And, but then he's set free, and he doesn't know how to live in freedom. Paul's going to say, there, there's, there, I'll show you how to live in freedom, because that prison, that's still prison, right? And, and so we've got to learn how to do this. How does this happen? He could only function out of his identity as a prisoner. And many of us run to particular identities apart from Christ, remembering who we are, beloved sons and daughters of the king. And we run after other things in the same, same way. We pursue our freedom through a particular identity. So play this out with me, okay? Now, I've talked a lot about this in recent days, but in the, in the global West, we have determined, we said this, freedom comes by doing whatever I want to do. And so I'm going to pursue a particular identity. I'll decide what my life is about, and I will ultimately find happiness, uh, which we define now as pleasure, by the way. I'll experience pleasure in my life, do whatever it is that, that makes you feel good, you go with that. It's a hedonistic, Epicurean kind of philosophy of life. More than half of Americans now, I've, I've seen three different studies of reference, that show half of, this is new, by the way, in our, in our nation, more than half. One study said 58% of all Americans believe there's no such thing as absolute truth. That there is no moral authority outside of ourselves. More than half of us, okay, the people we live with, do life with, go to work with, whatever else. There's no moral authority outside of myself. So play this out with me. Then it's anything goes, Right? You do whatever you want to do. You determine your identity. You determine your purpose and, and all the things. And, and there's no authority outside of yourself. Now, there's a book, a great book by Carl Truman, and it's called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And in it, and we're going to unpack a lot of this stuff, by the way, 
in my new apologetics course that I'm teaching on starting on Wednesday nights. Come join me. We're going to dive into all kinds of cultural things and apologetics. How do we engage our friends um, and coworkers? How do we understand what to say and to do in this cultural moment? To be light. But in the book, and in, in the, the subtitle of the book is this, Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to Sexual Revolution. In the book, he references Jean-Paul Sartre. You might know as a French philosopher, was a French philosopher. And Sartre said, he's not a Christian. Sartre said, if there is no outside authority, if there's no moral absolute truth outside of us, then he said, man is, he said it this way, damned to be free. Meaning, now you figure out what your identity is. You figure out what your life is all about. You figure out the meaning of your life. You figure out the purpose of your life. And this is where we are. And he says, we're damned to be free, condemned. Because it's hard to be God. And he says this, that is a life that is a recipe for a life of anxiety. Because it's hard to be God. And, and, and how about that? While our, our, you know, on the rise in our culture, and it, and it goes from successive generation, as we say, there is no absolute truth. There's no purpose outside of myself. There's no ultimate authority that tells me how I should live my life. As that's on the rise, anxiety is on the rise. And Sartre was on to something many years ago. Because that's where this plays out. We were meant to give our lives to something else, to someone else. We were were given by God this opportunity to come to him and to live our lives, not whatever we want to do, but to live for him instead because of all that he's done for us. Here's the thing. The secular story is not working. And this is good news because we step into that space and we say, you know what? I can step into this space and be a non-anxious presence in a world that is constantly filled with anxiety. And I can do that because I know who I am. Because we're not going to pursue pleasure in all kinds of things because that never plays out. Listen to this. Victor Frankl, who was, you might know, an Australian psychologist, Holocaust survivor, wrote probably the greatest little book of all time. I'm throwing down some hot opinions this morning. Um, It's a great book called Man's Search for Meaning. In it, he says this. Happiness cannot be pursued. It must ensue. Meaning, come after. It's the result of something else. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as the byproduct of one's surrender. Listen to this. He's not a Christian. He's a Jew. Not a Christian. One surrender to a person other than oneself. Pleasure is... Notice he says pleasure, happiness, he defines as pleasure, because that's what we do. Pleasure is and must remain a side effect or byproduct and is destroyed and spoiled to the degree to which it is made a goal itself. It's the paradox of hedonism, is what it's called. A philosophical term, not a Christian thing. The paradox of hedonism says you cannot find happiness by pursuing happiness. It comes by pursuing something else. And the side effect, if you will, the result is happening. Now, we've used the term joy. Peace is what we need, isn't it? Not anxiety, but a life that is mature in Christ. And it comes when I realize I've been justified by faith. And now I am seeking to be sanctified, to become like Jesus. And so if if immaturity is slavery, look at this. Maturity is freedom. It's what he's saying. Now, look at verse 4. But when the fullness of time, how does this happen? When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Notice how he describes him. These are all important phrases. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Okay? This, this masculine language is, this is radical. Daughters are now heirs. This is big time, like in this culture. Everybody's in. There's neither male nor female is what he said earlier. Slave or free. That's what he means. It's faith. So everybody's on the same level. 
Everybody, is, it's a great equalizer. It's by faith, not by works. Look at this. Just at the right time, the fullness of time, um, he sent his son. Now this is, and it says born of a woman. This is a poetic way of saying he was God and he was man. Because think about this. You don't have to say, and Jeff was born of a woman. Well, of course I was. Right? Now I say that culturally. Only women can give birth to men or to children. We know this, right? Okay, just some clarity. Just trying to bring clarity. Um, uh, anyway, so you don't have to say Jeff was born of a woman. He's speaking to the preexistence of Christ. He's the, born of a woman, comes into the world, and then look at what it says. He's under the law. This is the key point. See, our Savior had to be born under the same conditions that we were born under. This. Be perfect, then you can go to heaven. Be perfect, and then you can have a relationship with God. Good luck with that. Jesus is born under the law. He comes in and, yes, lives the perfect life for us as our substitute. The Greek word then says that word redeemed. He did so to redeem us is the word freedom, to set us free and so that we can grow up to be sons and daughters. And look at verse six. And because you are sons and daughters, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, there's two aspects to being a Christian, and he's referencing both of them here. We are justified. We are adopted into the family of God. Then the spirit comes to allow us, give us power to be sanctified. Sanctified is us joining God in what he's doing. It's my part in becoming like Jesus, because that's the obsession of my life. Not some other identity. I am justified. Now I'm going to live into that. And look, verse 4, it says Jesus is sent into the world to redeem us so that we're adopted, verse 5. And now look at this. The Spirit, verse 6, same language. Spirit is sent. And confirms within us, connects us to the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, so that we can cry out, Abba, Father. That we are now children, and it's an intimate relationship we have. This, this word, Abba, has been ruined by a lot of preachers and commentators to say, well, it means dada. No, it doesn't mean dada. It, 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 yes, it is daddy, and you can still go to the Middle East and hear kids. We talked about this uh, in the Lord's Supper, Lord's Prayer series, Jesus says, when you pray, pray this way. Pray our, our Abba. Meaning, it's a word of endearment. It's a word of intimacy. It's a, word, it's a loving relationship. And it's a, it's a word of honor for a child to say, you're my dad. Daddy, you're the one. And, and this is what he's saying here. We now cry out, Abba. And this cry, what is this crying out? It's, it's, a, it's a sense of, of dependence upon God. Because watch this. If immaturity is slavery, maturity is freedom. Here we go. We'll land here. Freedom is dependence, not independence. This is the twist. Do whatever you want to do. You'll find freedom. No, 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 no. Commit yourself to the one who has come to rescue you from your sin. You're totally dependent on him. I can say it this way. The Christian life, listen, total dependence on God is not an option. It's what it is. It is life and it is life in him. Because where we see this Abba, Jesus using the word Abba, Father, not just in the Lord's Prayer where he teaches us how to pray that way, but in the garden. In, in Mark chapter 14, 36, he's in the garden. He's crying out. Abba, Father, if there is a way that this cup could pass from me, let it be. But not my will, yours be done. See, the cry, the Abba cry, is a cry of dependence. It's a cry for help. Look at verse 7. So you are no longer a slave. Praise be to God. You're no longer a slave. Somebody said amen. You're no longer a slave. You don't have to keep going back there. You're a son, you're a daughter, and if you are a daughter, a son, then an heir through God. So here's where I'm going to challenge you. So who are you? Who are you? Hey, well, Jeff, I'm a Christian, so I guess I'm a son or daughter. I think, I, yeah, I am. Are you living that way? What I'm asking you is this. Have you made an intentional decision in your life to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? To be an apprentice 
of Jesus. Dallas Willard, who's probably the smartest guy I've ever read regarding discipleship, he says this. And this is why this is so rare to find this, even in Christian circles. He says, being a disciple, an apprentice of Jesus, is quite a different and obvious kind of thing. To make it a mystery is to misunderstand it completely. Like some of you have been coming to church forever and you're going, yeah, what is a disciple? What does that look like? I want to be a disciple. Friends, a disciple looks like Jesus. A disciple, an apprentice, comes in close proximity alongside the person they're seeking to emulate and copy everything that they do. That's what a disciple is. Is your, here's the question, is your complete obsession in life to be a disciple of Jesus? Do you wake up in the morning obsessed to become just like him? Not because now this is a new moralism, a new now try to be like Jesus is perfect. No, 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 no. Don't go there. It's a response to what he's done. Justification leads to sanctification. This is the life he's called us to. So what does this look like? It looks like this. It looks like, here's the question. What would Jesus do if he were in my place? What would Jesus do? How would he live if he were the father of my children? What would he do? That's being a disciple. But you've got to know what he would do. you got to know him. So you walk with him. What would Jesus do if he were sitting at my desk at my office? What would Jesus do if he were encountering this group of coworkers? How would he live his life right here? How would Jesus live if he was the mother of these preschoolers or in this home? If he was married to my spouse, what if Jesus was my, you know, me right here with my roommates? What would he be like? How would he live? That's what I'm going to do every single day. And you cannot do it apart from complete dependence on him by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to challenge you with this as we, we're going to close with a time of prayer and commitment, a time to actually move, to actually do something before we go. And here it is. Let me just play this out. Are you, are you immature or are you mature? If I can be so bold enough with people that I love, I want, I want so much of this for you. The freedom that comes with living in this. Immature Christians, they're prideful. They don't pray. Because they think they can do it without, without God. You're not dependent. Do you pray? Mature Christians pray, okay? Immature Christians want to be fed by everybody else, like babies. Mature Christians know how to feed themselves. They're pursuing the Lord every day. They're in his word. And they're also feeding others. See, immature Christians are consumers. Mature Christians are servants. This is why on this day, friends, we need a lot of people to step up to help us make disciples of more and more people. The Lord will, will give us, he will trust us with more people if every one of us who are members find our place of ministry. Immature Christians just come to church, show up and leave. Mature Christians show up to see what can I do? How can I serve? Immature Christians, they, 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 they are not yet fully engaged. They're not committed to accountable relationships. We have connect groups for you to get involved in. Can I say it? Immature Christians uh, are not baptized. They, they're not baptized. They're like, I don't want to, I'm not going to commit to that. And that's a major step into commitment to be a disciple of Jesus. He said so. You're proclaiming to the world, I'm in. I'm now going to be sanctified to become just like him. He is my Lord and master. I'll follow him. Immature Christians are not members of churches. Mature Christians have decided to join. And, and friends, this is where we are. I'm challenging us today because it's time. It's time for us to step out. Don't waste your life. Whatever you've got left with it, don't waste your life. Commit your life to him right now and today. And here's what I want you to do. Sometimes we got to move. And I'm asking the band to come up because we're going to close with the song. Uh, but we're going to first have some time of prayer. So we got some space and time. And I want you to do this. 
I want to, let's do this. Let's all just kind of put your stuff down. And would you stand just right where you are? And I'm going to ask us to actually move. We're going to have a prayer time where you may feel led, as many did in the early hour. And you may want to do this. Not manipulating anybody. Just if you want to come to say, Lord, here, here I am. I'm, I'm right here. Or maybe it's a prayer of desperation. Maybe you want to come forward with a spouse. Maybe you want to come forward with your family, like we had many young families in the first hour. Just come forward. Maybe you want to come and just say, I just want to come uh, for prayer. I need prayer. And we're going to have some folks up here. I'm going to come and be here. Uh, Philip Price, who's our, our chairman of our deacons, is going to come up here. Keith Beasley, uh, many of you may know, a former chair, now board of trustee chair. Cinnamon Thompson is going to be up here. She leads our prayer uh, committee, really a prayer champion. We're going to be here to pray for you and pray over you, if you would like that. If you want to just come, as many have done, just to come and say, I'm just going to come to the altar, and I'm going to say, Lord, here I am. And on this day, I commit my life uh, to you, anew. Some of you need to come forward and receive Christ, frankly. Some may want to come for, for baptism. You can come on all these reasons after this service is done. But I want to challenge you with this. This same Paul said, he said this after going through a season of great pain and struggle. And he didn't see a way out. He said, he said and the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Friends, if you're here today and you're like, man, I'm, 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 in, I'm in so much need right now. If you only knew. And I need him desperately. Friend, turn that cry for help. Abba, Father, turn it to him. Because here's the thing. If you're feeling really dependent today, if you're fearful, if you turn to him, you're in a really good place. Because look, here it is. If dependency on Christ is the goal, then weakness is an advantage. So, I'm going to ask you to come. You can come and pray over each other. Pray, bring a friend down, pray. If you want to just come, pray by yourself. You want to get on your knees, you can do that. You can do whatever you want. We just want to give you some space and time right here. Okay, so Lord, we ask that you'll move among us. Lord, we, uh, we pray. God, that you'd move in our hearts and we'd say yes to you. And we decide today, let it be another marker, a day where we are awakened to a new life, a new season, and we say yes to you, so find us here. We cry out to you together. Abba, Father, we love you. We come to you now. In Jesus' name.